quasi courts. And they're a little different than your, we call it constitutional judges, because the Constitution, both the U.S. and the state constitutions, mandate there be judges. But there are some judges that their positions are created because of a executive, meaning a function that the legislature and the executive branch, the governor, is executive, decided that this should be. One of those is where I used to work, which is the Office of Administrative Hearings, and then there's the Board of Appeals. There are judges here and there that are from that as well. Then we have tribal court judges here. Tribal courts are very interesting because they are a court of their own jurisdiction. And we have some tribal court judges here who will explain to you what they do. And then lastly, we have judge pro tems. And what a judge pro tem does is a substitute judge. And there's judge pro tems that serve on the um, judges on the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, on my bench, on the Superior Court. So we're going to hear from some of those today, too. So, what I want to do at this moment in time, so you guys get an idea just how many different judges we have here and who we have, I want to take a few minutes just to have judges stand up and stay standing when I call the level of, of uh, the report that you're hearing. And then we're going to ask, have you guys ask some questions of all of us. So, I don't think that we have Judge Benton here. I didn't see her. This is, uh, okay, so I won't start at the federal level, but we had Justice Yu, who was here from the state Supreme Court. Do we have anyone here from the Court of Appeals? If you would stand up and say your name. Well, My name is Lori K. Smith. 
I'm with the King County Superior Court. I am currently here uh, doing a criminal rotation, but in our court, there are 53 judges, and when you have a criminal rotation, you still have a civil caseload. So motions prior to trial still come to me in all of my civil cases, and then my actual trials are criminal cases. Before I was a judge, I was a court commissioner appointed by the uh, judges that uh, now are my colleagues, and before that, I was a prosecutor. which means that we don't get to hear the same kind of cases that the Superior Court hears. We hear and do trials on misdemeanor cases and civil cases where the jurisdictional limit is uh, $100,000 per claimant. Uh, depending on the day of the week, uh, I'm either doing a civil calendar or a criminal calendar. So Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, I'm usually doing uh, two days of civil, one day of criminal, and Thursdays and Fridays I'm doing criminal cases in Seattle. So I split my time between Shoreline and, and also in Seattle. I am the presiding judge of the West Division of the King County District Court. Okay. I'm Marilyn Page. I'm a district court judge in Kitsap County. That's Bremerton, Port Orchard area across the bridge. Um, and uh, I too am a district court judge. We do felony first appearances, that is setting bail primarily uh, in felony matters. We do uh, criminal cases where someone could go to jail for up to a year, uh, the same jurisdiction that Judge Anderson has. Uh, civil cases up to $100,000. Orders of protection, name changes. We do a lot of name changes for people of all ages. Um, and uh, we have a, a couple of th therapeutic courts, um, a behavioral health court, and we're uh, looking at developing other therapeutic or courts that look at people's behaviors and try to get to the root cause of a problem before it becomes a criminal. Do we have any judges here that sit on municipal court? We do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Karen Donahue. I'm the presiding judge at Seattle Municipal Court. And uh, we are also a limited jurisdiction court. We don't do quite the same thing that district courts do. Mostly, we're also called the people's court because most people who come into contact with the criminal justice system come to courts like Seattle Municipal Court. And we do cases primarily uh, like theft, from, like shoplifting theft uh, cases. For, so for somebody who is accused of uh, Actually, Justice, you gave a pretty good example. Somebody who's accused of stealing a phone would come to our court. Um, also, we do a lot of driving while under the influence cases and assault, minor assault cases. Um, we also have um, therapeutic courts. So people who have um, mental health issues will go into our mental health court. And we try and get them hooked up with services so they don't have to stay in the criminal justice system. We also have a court, uh, it's called a Veterans Treatment Court, where we work with um, Veterans Administration for people who served our country, and, and, and we want uh, to give them the respect and support that they deserve after serving for our country and often uh, getting involved in the criminal justice system after leaving uh, service. Um, we also do parking and traffic infractions, so if you ever get a speeding ticket, if you're driving, don't, but if you do, you come to a court, like a municipal court, uh, to have that uh, resolved. So, Sharon, is that what you mean when you say a court of limited jurisdiction? Yes, we, we, only, um, we only can hear certain types of cases. We can't hear any felony charges, so anything that's... What's a felony? Anything that's... <laughs> Anything that is uh, punishable by less than a year in jail is what we would hear in municipal court or in district court. Uh, felony is a much more serious crime, um, and uh, it could be 
you could be uh, given a variety of sentences, but if you go, if you're sentenced to prison, it would have been because you were charged with a felony crime like murder or uh, a serious, more serious assault. Mm -hmm. And you said you were a presiding judge. What's that mean? Presiding judges do uh, the, the business side of the court as well as the legal side of the court. So um, I spend a lot of my days uh, reviewing, uh, well, assigning the other judges uh, trials and assigning the other judges the responsibilities that they'll have. So I get to say, um, Judge McKenna, you're going to hear the mental health court calendar. And Judge Kondo, you're going to hear our domestic violence cases. So I'm responsible for assigning the judges to um, their different roles, but I'm also responsible for the business of the court. So I uh, work with our court administrator on uh, things like uh, budget, working with our city council uh, when they pass a new ordinance to, uh, to try and make sure that uh, we understand what it is. I also let them know what the court is doing because we do a lot in court that isn't just related to trials. Um, we uh, look at things like um, whether or not it's fair to uh, charge somebody a fine or a fee and how they're going to pay that fine and fee. We, we look at, those are called legal financial obligations, and we look at whether or not those need to be re-examined to see if they are fair and if people can pay for them. We also look at whether or not uh, it's uh, a good idea to keep jail, people in jail before they have a trial because everybody is presumed innocent. And so I work with uh, city council and the city attorney and the public defenders on kind of policy issues as well as legal issues. Thank you. Okay, now moving on to our other types of judicial officers. Do we have anyone here that is from the Office of Administrative Hearings? That would be me. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Lorraine Lee, and I am the Chief Administrative Law Judge for Washington State. That's a mouthful. <laughs> what that means is I am part of the executive branch. I've been in my job eight years. I was appointed by Governor Gregoire and then reappointed by Governor Inslee and confirmed by the Senate. In my agency, we have about 100 administrative law judges, and our uh, disputes uh, always deal with a state agency or a government agency decision. And if a business or a person is unhappy about that, then they can ask for an administrative hearing. So an administrative hearing is like a trial, a mini trial, where it's a neutral zone. The parties come, they swear under oath to tell the truth, and the judges hear both sides and then decide what happened, what are the facts, and apply the law. Let me give you an example. Suppose there's a convenience store, ABC Mini Mart, and a 17-year-old teenager goes in and uses a fake ID to buy a case of beer. Would anybody get in trouble? Do you think somebody should get in trouble? What do you think? What would happen? Who gets in trouble? The kid. Okay, the kid. Who else? The cashier. The cashier. I hear that. Very good. The cashier. Who else? Maybe the parent. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. What? Maybe the person. Maybe the person. Fake ID. Okay. How about the mini mart business owner? They could get in trouble. They could have their license take away. And then the business owner would say, wait a minute, I want to have a trial. I want to have an administrative hearing. So they would have a hearing. Also, the cashier, the store clerk, might get a ticket from the enforcement officer. So that's what an administrative hearing could, could deal with. And we have many different types of matters, about 40,000 administrative hearings with less in a year's time. So that's what we do. Thank you. The teenager, a stern talking to by parents, and certainly could be charged with uh, buying alcohol. But that's over uh, the prosecutor makes that decision. Good question. 
Chief, you said that you're chief of the Office of Administrators. How is your job as chief different than your administrative logic? Right. So I don't hold hearings myself. My job is a lot like Judge Van Dornick, making sure the lights are working, the computers are working, that the cases are moving along, they don't take too much time. Um, a lot of the administrators so. But fun. Do we have anyone here that is from the Board of Industrial Appeals? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Meng Lee Chi. I'm an Assistant Chief Industrial Appeals Judge at the Board. Um, like Lorraine, who was just immediately before me, uh, we hear appeals from lots of different peoples and parties, but mainly from um, orders that were issued by one specific agency from my agency, which is the Department of Labor and Industries. They issue orders, and then parties who are aggrieved by that can file an appeal. They disagree with that order, and those orders then come to us to make a decision. Um, so mainly, industrial insurance is workers' compensation, workplace safety violation or alleged violations when they come to us. Um, that's how our work differs. I do occasionally go into the courtroom. Um, I used to be one of our hearings judges and then our mediation judges, and now um, I'm more on the administrative side of that. But when my judges are not available, I sometimes will step in and handle cases. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. And tribal judges. Tribal Court Judge for the Grand Ronde Court of Grand Ronde, Oregon. I'm what's termed a law-trained judge. I hold a law degree, and to serve with the Grand Ronde Tribal Court, you need to be a member in good standing of your bar association, and we have a reciprocity with the Oregon State Bar with Washington State Bar. I have presided there for two plus years, and at the appellate level, we hear um, appeals that have been decided by the lower court, often matters involving um, tribal administrative issues. So, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Because I have presided as a pro tem judge in the past, I have sat throughout Washington State at different uh, tribal courts, and I heard um, traffic matters there, um, fishing violations, administrative decisions of the court, and so the relationship between um, federal decisions is if a matter has gone all the way up through the tribal court and, um, judicial process, some matters may be appealed to the federal court level from there for decisions. And you said that you were a law trained uh, I'm a law trained judge. So that means I went to law school. Um, some tribal codes, some Indian tribes, have, uh, they all have specifications for who is, who is qualified to serve as a judge. And some of them specify that they want to have a Native American um, sitting as their judge. And Grand Ronde specifically specifies that in their code that they want a Native American to sit as their judges. And not all tribal courts um, have that in their code, but I'm honored to serve in that capacity as a Native American. We have a question over here. Do we have a second mic that can help me out? Say somebody wanted to find out how much the 
you contact them and they have an enrollment office, an enrollment officer, and you make an inquiry there. Perhaps there's an email way to do that as well. And for the, there's, up in Canada, there's Blackfeet and then there's also Blackfoot. So I think, I, which is it? Montana is Blackfoot, thank you. It's my husband, Kevin Paul. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you contact that agency, which is a very large tribe, the Cherokee Nation is a very large group of people as well. Does that help you? Do we have anyone here? Thank you very much. Do we have anyone here that serves as a pro tem judge or a commissioner pro tem? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tracy Flood, and I have served as a pro tem judge in three different jurisdictions um, for the Office of Administrative Hearings, actually four, uh, for the municipal courts um, in Port Orchard as well as Edmonds, um, and then the district courts in King County and Kitsap County. And I actually worked with Judge Harrison. And each court, as you've heard, does different things. So when you're pro tem, it's important that you have a relationship with the judge that you're working for and filling in for. So when the judge has to go to a conference or takes vacation or um, anything happens where there's a shortage, then pro tems fill in. And one of the things that um, I did at the Office of Administrative Hearings, which is kind of similar to Superior Court, was I did child support hearings, which is what happens when you, in the Superior Court, sometimes you have um, orders that need to be amended or modified or established. And in Municipal Court and District Courts, I dealt a lot with um, protection orders uh, from the standpoint of there's little small things that happen between neighbors, <laughs> little disputes, it could be young people, um, a lot of traffic infractions, and those are similar across the board. But the experience of working for a judge is to make sure you maintain um, what we term as the status quo, the norm. You wanna make sure that you understand the rules of that court, and you understand how that judge runs their courtroom. And um, there's sometimes where you're looking at um, different things and each court has different programs that they use so you're running different computer systems. There's a lot of knowledge that goes around as a whole. But it's a great experience and for me it's um, was an experience that I take into my current job where I write decisions um, on the federal level. So each level gives you the experience that you, you need if you're interested in being a full-time judge. And that is my ultimate goal. So this is a step in that direction. Could you talk a little bit about what you do currently um, in the federal system in your current role? So currently, um, since April, I um, write administrative decisions for the Social Security Administration. And prior to that, I wrote decisions for the Department of Labor, um, U.S. Department of Labor. The federal? On the federal side, because there's the state. Side in which the industrial kids court deals with. So, um, both of the fields that I work in as an attorney advisor is um, very specialized. On um, the, the side where Department of Labor, we work directly with employees of Department of Energy facilities where they had been injured and there was some awards um, that were granted to them, and um, I was the final decision maker. Um, and on the social security level, the hearings happen, and I assist the judges, the administrative law judges, in getting their decisions out and making sure that everything that was reflected in the hearings is reflected in the orders. Thank you. So we um, have about 15 minutes left, and then now we want to get 
give you young ladies an opportunity to ask questions of all of our judges. Some ladies, uh, we have a couple questions that were submitted by email before, before today. So I'm going to um, read one of those questions now, unless Lillian would like to read her question. I met Lillian earlier this morning. Okay, I know she's here, but I'm going to read her one of her questions, and I'd like one of the, a couple of the judges to answer. I feel like certain cases, especially very emotional ones, can be difficult to decide on. How do you remain objective and keep your personal feelings in check? Would one of our judges like to address it? Oh, Lily, I'm here, Jillian. Jill oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> Did you want me to ask that question, or would you like to ask one of your questions? Oh, that question's good. Okay, all right. Well, one of the things that uh, all judges abide by is the rule of law. And so even if something is extremely emotional, we don't generally make a decision based on our emotions. We actually have to follow the law. And sometimes that gives us a, a great foundation. We still are human beings, as just as you said earlier today, and we still make decisions based on our own experiences. We are human beings who have had different experiences in our lives. Um, but we do follow the rule of law, and sometimes that makes it so that you can make a sound decision and not an emotional decision. I just wanted to add that there could be a case that you are so intimately involved in that you would say, I can't hear that case. If my brother, my sister, my family, my best friend is involved in a case, nobody wants me on that case, probably not even them. And so you would say, I'm going to recuse, which means I'm too close to this case, I can't be objective, and I so, so I won't hear that case. into this building, it just reminded me of what it was like to be a brand new lawyer and walk down some of those uh, staircases. This room has not changed much at all. So, and uh, as, a, as a baby lawyer coming in here, filled with other lawyers that you felt like were criticizing or at least observing what you were doing, it was pretty intimidating. Um, and so that, that was kind of an interesting experience. So I became a lawyer really because I had been working as a secretary after law school, and one of my bosses came up to me and said, good job, literally patted me on top of the head. And at that moment in time, I can still remember, it still sends shivers up my spine, I had this little cartoon bubble over my head because of course I couldn't say anything um, in that time. But the little bubble said, I can't stay here. <laughs> and I had to kind of rework and think what uh, my career path was going to be. Um, I had taken the LSAT, which is a preparatory exam that you take during law school to see if you're a good candidate for law school. It's kind of like a PSAT for those of you that are in uh, high school or juniors or seniors now. Uh, but they offer that in college. And um, I had taken that, not really intending to go to law school, but because my folks wanted me to do that, and that was just not part of my plan. Um, but it was an opportunity um, that I took, and um, it, I think partly because I'd been out of school a little while before I went to law school, I really appreciated that. Um, to become a judge, I was working as a criminal defense lawyer for a private law firm here in Pierce County. Uh, one of my senior partners was an appointed municipal court judge for the city of Key Carver. Again, just on the other side of the bridge here from Tacoma. 
Uh, and uh, when I was only about, I think I had three years of experience, I was called to pro tem, be that substitute judge for him over in uh, Gig Harbor. Uh, they had never had a woman who had sat in the court uh, over there. And in fact, the only row fit my senior partner, who was about 6'3". So imagine me that first day holding the robe, like dressing up in your mother's clothes uh, as I tried to walk up onto the bench. Um, but it was a complete change of culture uh, for the court and a wonderful learning experience that I took first just because I thought it would make me a better lawyer and then found that I really appreciated the opportunity. So that was my path.
After losing, I contacted Judge Rumba and I asked, what do I need to do? Strange move, you'd think. Judge Rumba said, I think what you were missing was similar experience. So have you considered the Board of Industrial Insurance Appeals? And Judge <laughs> Ming Chi here is a colleague of mine from there. So I did, I applied and I got the position. And I worked there for a while, put my application in again for Superior Court in 2013. Didn't hear from anybody. And then in 2015, the call came. I easily could have given up and not tried, but I kept trying. I kept trying to figure out what was missing. And with the help of my now colleagues on the bench, these were judges I was a litigator in front of who encouraged me. Many of them saw me win cases, lose cases, because you don't always win. And with their um, support, I was able to then make it by appointment in 2015, which is why it's so important for me. I came to this country at the age of 16. I don't have family here. I have a brother in New Jersey. So I'm a transplant. I am now the only sitting black female on any of the trial level courts here in Pierce County. I am also the first openly gay judge here. So I have many barriers, institutional barriers, that should actually, should have prohibited me from being here. But I'd like my colleagues on the Pierce County Superior Court bench to stand up. And I'd like you also, when you get a chance today, the students here, to take a look at our wall because things have changed. But my colleagues here on the bench, please stand up. And the reason I'm having them stand up is because you'll notice something. We all don't look alike. But we all treat each other with respect. And we all care about each other on this bench. And when I came on, as I said, I was the only black female on the bench. But now, with the help of my female colleagues and the men on our bench, we now have a black commissioner. Stand up, commissioner. So, for this bench, failure is not an option. Diversity is a must. And we're working on it, and this was the first of many steps in that direction as far as the National Association of Women Judges Color Justice Program. We're getting close to the end, but I have one important question that I think needs to be asked, and we're going to ask our commissioner who snuck in to answer that for us. And that is, how do you think being a woman, and specifically a woman of color, has affected um, your insights when you're on the bench? And does it have any attributes for the people, from the perspective of the people who appear before you? You didn't introduce yourself as you want to Good morning, my name is Sabrina Ahrens and I am clearly one of the commissioners on our bench. Um, I'd say in terms of the impact that I have on the bench, that it's a positive impact. I, I can't believe that folks, when they come into a courtroom, can't look forward and see someone that looks like them and believe that the issues that they have, that their experience is going to be appreciated. It's not to say that it otherwise isn't, but I think that there's something different when you come in and there's someone who looks like you who may have grown up the same way or um, who may have had some of the same familial um, experiences that you can kind of appreciate, like, okay, you know, this person is going to hear me, they're going to know what I mean when I say that I tie my hair up at night, or not just that that comes up, but it, it's just that, that, that there's some shared experiences and that you may be heard in a different way than you otherwise may have been heard. Um, what was the other question? The first part. Um, and um, the impact, well, you pretty much answered that question. <laughs> so one Um, all of our judges and our commissioners and our judge pro tems, 
who were the first person in their family to ever go to college or law school, please stand. Okay, so 
So let me tell you a little bit about Shanice, which you probably can read as well. She loves books, writing, and all things black, as she says, of course. She's an aspiring criminal justice lawyer, and she has a passion for helping others. When she's not blogging or tied up with other things, she's spending her time volunteering, so giving back. And that was one of the things I really was pleased to see with Shanice. And I, you know what I love? The next line. She says, I know that I'm destined to do great things in this lifetime. And that's something we all want to make sure you all get from us, because we know what we believe you're destined to be great in whatever you choose to do. The other part is what she says on her, the Melanin Diary website, is, and it's a Facebook page, but she also has a website, and it says, I'm on a mission to change lives, and I'm doing whatever it takes to give it. Now, how many of you feel that way, that you're on a mission to change lives? See some hands, see? Uh, let's give ourselves a hand for that. And I'm going to ask a couple of the judges, since we have some time, why they believe they're on a mission to change lives. Did Lori Smith? Janice, are you there? Oh, hello. Okay. 
so many amazing people and to be able to do things like this all because I just chose to follow my passion. So if you see a problem in the world, you have to do something about it to change it. Whether, I'm not sure, it's going to be different for everyone, so I can't tell you guys like, exactly what to do. I can just give kind of advice on what I would do.